Okay, so I'll stop the share now and uh, we're gonna give a few introductions. First of all, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Michael Ask from the Hospital for Special Surgery uh, for joining us on this journal club. More people will be uh, coming in. Um, uh, Marty Nichols says, good evening from Austin, Texas. Thanks, Marty. Good to see you again. Ron John, and a lot of people, a lot of call outs. Um, Dr. Ast is an attending in orthopedics at the Hospital for Special Surgery and is also the Chief Innovation Officer. Is that correct, Michael? That's correct. That's correct. And uh, I have known Mike for just a couple of years and, uh, and uh, really enjoyed the friendship and camaraderie. Um, Michael wrote an article that was um, in our journal early on, um, which I will first share um, as soon as I get to my share screen, okay? Um, which was quite uh, an article. You can see the trend to watch, the migration of total joint replacement outpatient surgery. That was written September 10th, 2020. All right, and there's been a lot written since that time. Um, this article got 2,622 views and 63 downloads, All right? That is the entire views and download of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in a 10 year period, I think. Uh, maybe not, maybe not. Maybe not. Um, and this article is what we'll be discussing today. Okay, which I, th I think is phenomenal. Um, at the time, this was uh, also had some uh, banner ads on it from uh, Stryker, and I want to thank them for that. Um, but this is the article that we will be uh, discussing. Um, so, Mike, uh, how, I'm just going to start off. What, what made you begin to sort of look at this trend and feel that it was going on it, it, at the pace it was around that time. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I started personally doing outpatient arthroplasty in 2014. Okay. So I've been doing it kind of early on, certainly not like the, the originals uh, who'd been doing it since the early 2000s. But uh, in, in, the, in the trend of this migration, I was relatively early on. And I did it early on not for any other reason except that the ambulatory surgery center was the only place I could find control of my patients. When I was in private practice in Princeton before I came back to HSS, you know, the hospital just became so hard to control what medications patients were given, what protocols they went through, what pathways they took. And so we ended up taking a, a huge amount of our practice to our surgery center. When the, when the trend started, when the migration really started, that's when I came back to HSS in about 2018 to help, uh, to help run and guide that transition at HSS. And just seeing a, a major institution like HSS, a place traditionally known for, you know, we, we jokingly, when I was a fellow, we used to call it Hotel HSS. Patients would stay for, you know, for weeks at a time. Um, it, uh, it, you notice like, wait a second, even this place uh, where Doug Paget so eloquently describes it as a decades of tradition unimpeded by progress. <laughs> um, if, uh, if this place is going, is going to start moving, maybe the trend is bigger. So I started, you know, talking to friends, looking around at the time I, I had a, a, the opportunity to work with a lot of really great people throughout the country and everyone was seeing it everywhere. It wasn't just in our little town. It wasn't just the Northeast. It was in California. It was in the South. It was in, you know, the, the Northwest. And so, uh, you realized it was more than just a couple of centers. It was more than just some early innovators doing something special. It was just what was happening and what was going to continue to happen. And, and that's kind of why we decided to take a little deeper dive into it. And again, like you said, and this isn't unique to something that I've done. There's lots of people have looked at this now. I mean, if you read any of the, uh, anything in the world of orthopedics, 50% of it is about how all of orthopedics is moving to outpatient, whether it's arthroplasty, whether it's spine surgery. And so I think uh, it's, it, it, it was a trend to watch that is now a trend that is occurring and, and has become the, the, the game of to predict what comes next. So it's it really fascinating, I mean, that you started in 2014, uh, moved, moved over to the, to the, uh, to the empire, to, to the hotel. Um, 
And, but you noted in your article, and I thought this was interesting, that so many surgeons already use multimodal analgesia, the blood sparing protocol and other techniques already. What do you think, why do you think certain surgeons, despite using all that, are still hesitant to bring well, you know, patients? It, we don't like change. Right? We don't like change. We're very, I, I, you know, I can tell in the OR if somebody hands me a different mallet than the one I normally use right. just by how it feels. And immediately I'm uncomfortable. Right. I have, I have several of my colleagues who hoard the marking pens because if they run out of those, they give us different ones, which still mark patients just fine. They just look different. So we don't like it. Surgeons do not like change. Yeah. And so I think the number one reason we do it is we don't like to do anything different. We're comfortable where we are. We're happy where we are. And in most cases, I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing. At the same time, there's also fear, right? Remember that as physicians, we start with do no harm, right? So our number one, our number one goal is not to innovate. It's not to change. It's not to do different things. It's to ensure safety. And so if anything feels even a bit unsafe, we're going to be very, very reticent to that change. In fact, even for someone like me, the only reason I made the change was because I thought it might be safer. I was uncomfortable with the safety of my patients being placed on uh, you know, aggressive anticoagulation that I didn't order by medical doctors who were following old guidelines and things like that. It was a safety thing that drove that change for me. And so I think, that, I think that's the biggest thing. People are always afraid of whether or not it's going to be as safe as what they've traditionally been doing in, you know, in, in general hospital-based settings. It's a great, great answer. I, I, I think it's true. I think um, we are afraid of change and we also hear a, one horror story and it informs us to do nothing, right? Well, and, the, you know, the, the one in New York was Joan Rivers, right? Right. The, the, I, and I've said it all the time. It, from the beginning of this, I said it takes one Joan Rivers to ruin everything. And this is not meant in any way uh, downplay the, the tragedy that was um, what was what her death in that in a uh, in a surgery center. Although they were three blocks from where I'm sitting right now in my office, yeah. it was right down the road. I mean, something terrible can happen. And the moment you hear it, you know. Now, to be fair just as many people die in general hospitals for lots of different reasons. But like you said, you just hear that one story and viscerally you react in such a way that your job is to do everything you can to prevent that. So getting back onto the hesitancy, do you get, or do you feel that surgeons in general, I don't, I don't want to put you on a spot at your hospital, but do you feel that surgeons who work in hospitals get a lot, what's the nature of the pressure they get from the hospitals to not bring it to the ASC? Oh, I mean, it's, it's huge. And, and even here, right, even, even at, at our institution, but at every institution I've, I've worked at, uh, you know, they're not, they're, no hospital has any interest in losing one of their biggest revenue generators, right? For whatever they say, oh, we don't make as much money when you do Medicare. Oh, stop doing this, right? Orthopedics, arthroplasty specifically, makes enormous amounts of money for hospitals. And they are in absolutely no rush to watch it go out the door. And whether it's going out to the door to one of their surgery centers, or whether it's going out to a independent surgery center, or whether it's going, they don't care. All of those to them are revenue losses because even the reimbursement at a hospital level and a surgery center level are different. So even if they do the same job in, the, in what I would argue is the correct side of service, they're gonna make less money for it. They don't want that, especially as they look to offset huge losses even today from the COVID pandemic, from the decreasing reimbursement for primary care, for OBGYN, for emergency medicine, for these you know, insurance companies that are starting to decide that patient shouldn't have gone to the ER. So we're only going to pay you like you're an urgent care center. Or we're going to deny the ER visit. I mean, right. there are things going on in our environment that make the dollars and cents that we bring in arthroplasty very important to hospitals. So they will, they will hold on for, uh, for all they can. You know, so I, I want to... Um pivot a little bit into the idea of you were doing hospital base for a long time and you still are, you know, a certain number. What, there is a shift. There is a very big shift in resources. Uh, the hospital supplies a number of resources. Let's say you keep the patient in for a couple of days. 
A lot of people take care of your patient for you and prepare you for discharge. Now you're in your own ASC. So where do those resources come from to substitute? This guy. Right. <laughs> right. And there have been, been some great articles about this, right? There have been some wonderful papers written. Max Courtney wrote a couple of them from Rothman. There have been a bunch that show it is, it is more work to do outpatient arthroplasty well. It's just a shift in the time when the work is done, right? right. In, in the traditional model, the work starts at admission and ends at discharge. Let's call it three days later, right? Two minutes right. later, five days, whatever it is. In the outpatient model, it starts six weeks ahead of time. And in my eyes, it ends at admission. All right. the hard work is done. If you do it correctly, from, ad from admission on, you're finished, right? They, they know what they're doing. Their home care is set up. They've got their prescriptions. Their family knows what they're doing. Their discharge is planned. It's all done. Then you just keep rolling, right? Then, then the pathway is set and the patient just moves down that pathway. You can argue there's still work to be done in, in yeah. follow-up and, and patient engagement and making sure that you, they've got adequate access to you, to your hospital, to, to your practice or whatever. But the big, big heavy lift just gets lifted from the back end and dropped on the front end. It doesn't go away. Yeah, so with that said, what are some of the tools that someone who wants to start doing this, you know, I'm talking about specifically not, not hospital outpatient, you know, or hospital 23 hour, but let's just say, you know, Dr. X who's working, working at a uh, particular place. What, what kind of manpower tools or other type of tools would you recommend somebody using you know, you do. Yeah, I think I, I think when you build these programs from the start, and I sort of look back to how we started in the beginning. There's a couple of things. Number one, the most important thing you can do to get this started is to build your team. Right? You can't do anything alone. You need a team. And and in my mind, especially at an ambulatory surgery center, your team is is your surgeon champion, whoever that is. It's your anesthesia champion, whoever that is. The person who's going to help you guide your anesthetic protocols and what you're going to do. You need a nursing champion. Mm -hmm. Our practice invested in a nurse navigator uh, right. once our program was up and running was super helpful because it was the singular point of contact for the patient. It was who ran the pre-classes and pre-tours and all of those things. And it was who the patients knew they could contact afterwards if they were having a problem because you really want to keep them out of the emergency room. But you need a physical therapist champion as well who's going to run your pre-physical therapy because again, I think a lot of programs now, just like ours does, they require you to go to a therapy visit before the surgery. And really what you're doing is you're doing your post-operative gait training beforehand. How do I walk with a cane or a walker? How do I go up and down stairs? How do I safely get in and out of the shower and on and off the toilet? Whatever the, the case may be, you want to, like you, like you said, Ira, like they're not going to be in the hospital to learn that. Right. So you got to teach them all that stuff up front. So I think the most important thing is figuring out who all those things are. You need a class, you need some written and or nowadays our information's on video so they can watch right. it over and over and over again. Um, back then I, I had this thing, I've never heard of it, Ira, it's called a book. Yeah, right. that before? It's crazy. It had a spiral binding and words and, and paper, it was, it was wild. But, uh, but you know, we had a book for hips, a book for knees, a book right. for you knees, the whole thing. And I think that that was useful. I think it's helpful. And there, I will tell you to this day, there are still some patients who really like books. They like holding right. things, they like taking notes. And I think that's very useful. Um, but I think the nurse navigator, somebody who they knew would be kind of their point of contact was probably the most valuable thing we did. But of course, it, that, that's cost. So that, didn't, that wasn't there on day one, right? We started- Yeah, our, that was a first, cost, yeah. Right, in our first seven months, we did seven joints in our surgery center, right? One a month, because we were too nervous to do more than that. We wanted to make sure each one did okay, right. right? So it wasn't until we started doing several a day, several a week in a consistent fashion that we saw that, that you know, an FTE was, was worth it and was going to provide value. And so we hired one of our nurses from the surgery center to become that nurse navigator. And again, was a super, super valuable and totally worthwhile uh, decision. Yeah, Marty, uh, Marty Nichols has a question. Marty, you want to unmute? You want me to ask you a question for you? Yeah, either way, I'll, I'll go toward that. How much of the um, reluctance do you think was driven by the inability to bill and, and by all the headaches and hassles of billing from an ambulatory surgery center? Yeah, I think uh, early on, that was, a, that was a real concern. 
Um, and I think it, it is, it remains a huge problem, right? We should be doing all our total shoulders and surgery centers, but right? you don't walk on your hands. There's no reason you need to be anywhere else, but we can't because there's still no billing codes for shoulder replacement for the vast majority of centers. And so it gets listed as an unlisted shoulder procedure, which gets paid nothing and doesn't cover an implant. And so there are still billing concerns. And I think Marty, you're absolutely right. Um, I will tell you that our first three joints who did our surgery center, we didn't get paid for. Uh, we, we like submitted a bill, nothing happened. It went nowhere. And what it led to though, was an interesting conversation with one of our local payers saying, Hey, look, you're not paying us for this. You realize the value we're bringing. And we went from no contract to in one year, a gold status preferred contract to the second year by 2016, the first bundled payment in America with that payer. So it is if while, while it's a problem, you know, sometimes problems are opportunities. If I could follow up with that, how close do you think we are with, the, with these deductibles now being 5,942 on average and, and slated to go to 8,500 by 25? How close are we to this being a cash, a cash business? I, for for 8,000 bucks, you could pay cash and have it done. I mean, and, and the answer is I, there, there is no doubt that a segment of the population will likely end up in that situation for elective care, right? Because it'll actually be cheaper to go outside of your insurance and pay directly than it will to be covered to cover your deductible. And it also will be super dependent on the time of year, even like it is right now. I mean, I remember the joke. So I, I uh, was lucky enough early in my career to work with a, a gentleman named Paul Lotke. If, uh, if anybody knows who he is, one of the fathers of, of knee replacement. And so Paul and I used to joke that he'd only work till Thanksgiving because no one wanted surgery in December. No one. It was too close to Christmas. It was too close to holidays. And so he'd have, you know, all this time off in December with nothing to do. I, for anybody in practice right now, and I'm, I'm sure Ahmed and a lot of our, our other younger surgeons will, will tell you, like, that's our busiest month because everyone's deductibles are paid off and they want their surgery by 1231. They will have surgery on New Year's Eve because they just got to get in before that deductible resets for January 1st. So there's no doubt. There's no question, Marty. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, for, for a lot of elective care, not necessarily just hip and knee arthroplasty, for a lot of elective care, that especially for younger patients who don't fill their deductible every year, uh, it's going to be cheaper to just pay cash. Interesting. So there was a question. Ahmed Siddiqui. Hi, Ahmed. Uh, would you like to ask your question or you want me to ask it for you? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll ask. Uh, you know, I completely agree with that, Mike. My busiest time is from like Thanksgiving to like New Year's and probably the last two weeks of the year are, are absolutely the busiest. So I definitely understand that. Um, so I guess my question was, how much are you using regional blocks? I know what the data shows that there's no huge difference, but early on in my career, I've had really good success by doing like the multimodal pain cocktail and doing blocks at the surgery center. And, and it gives like, you know, almost 24 hours worth of pain relief, especially for the knees. It's like a home run, but for the hips, you know, I know again, what the data shows, I, I was doing the fascia iliac and the peng blocks and just recently had some instances of, you know, an inadvertent femoral nerve blocks by chance, I guess it was used there from the anesthesiologist, but, you know, I guess what's your experience on doing kind of both the blocks and uh, the multimodal pain cocktail in these ASC joints? Yeah. I, you know, I think it, it like you said, it, it's a, there's a lot of messy data out there. So it's a little bit unclear. I'll tell you personally, um, I do a periarticular injection of some kind in every single patient hips and knees. In all, in all of my AM surge and in hospital, I actually don't treat my hospital versus ambulatory cases any differently at all. It's exactly the same from an anesthetic perspective. Um, so I do not do fascia iliaca, peng blocks. I had exactly the same experience you did. Um, that I don't think it's user error. I just think some people's fascial layers aren't exactly as tight as others. And so it'll just leak out the femoral nerve. And pain is not really an issue with hip replacements. I, I, I can count on you know one hand in most years how many patients I've had with extreme amounts of pain after a hip replacement, that wasn't because they had a paraprosthetic fracture or something. So, uh, so I don't think it's a big deal. So I have not found uh, regional anesthetics that useful on the hip side. On the knee side, we do periarticular injection, like I said, adductor canal blocks, and IPAC blocks in every single patient. Um, and I, I understand that people will tell me it's overkill. I'm happy to, to, to debate that with anyone, because I think, it, like to your point, what I'm going for is immediate early pain relief. Is it better at two weeks? I don't really care, to be honest, because I think there's a huge psychological component to the recovery from surgery. And when patients feel good in those first few days, they know eventually they'll feel good again. 
And if they wake up in excruciating pain, they spend the next three months in a, in a depression, fearful that they will never be pain-free again. Uh, maybe this is because my mother's a psychologist, but I really think that there is so much to that early pain relief that we don't describe well. And I think a lot of it is psychological. Completely. Sorry to interject, but, interject, oh. but I completely agree with that. You know, one of the early, you know, when I was talking to some of the anesthesiologists, you know, it, or earlier on at the centers and even at the hospital, that was one of the things that we always, you know, talked about that it's overkill and we probably don't need, it's one or the other. And I kind of said the same thing. And obviously there's no great data to support that, but I keep telling everybody like that first 24 to 36 hours, like it's unbelievable how comfortable they are. Uh, and, and like the, what you said, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge mental boost for them because, you know, by a couple of days later, the pain kind of hits. And by that time they're taking the medicines routinely. So it's never, they're never really playing catch up. So I, I agree with that. Of course you agree with me. We're both from Staten Island. Um, but there actually is a little bit of data, right? There, there was a, our, our anesthesiologists here are not to just like tout HSS data because there's lots of other great data from everywhere else too. But the HSS uh, anesthesia group did this wonderful randomized controlled trial comparing the adductor canal block and a periarticular injection to a periarticular injection alone and to an adductor canal alone. Actually, it might've been a femoral nerve block at the time. Um, and the combination was better. The combination was better. And they repeated it in not as well done of a study, to be honest, because the control group wasn't as good, where they showed that adding the IPAC block was even better than that. So I think there's some data. I, the last one is not the super best data, but they were RCTs. So the, I, I think there is value there. So Mark, I was going to ask you a question about Really, uh, I'm dating myself by calling it the $64,000 question. It should be who wants to be a millionaire question, which is how do you decide which patient goes to the ASC? That's, that's a, people are always asking that. How do you decide this patient, that patient, who, do you use it, a you know, tool? Do you use a measure? It, depend, it depends how controversial you want me to be in the next eight, eight minutes, right? Like, because I could be like our friend Craig, who's going to say everyone goes to the ASC, right? Yeah. You either go to the ASC or you don't go to surgery, right? Yeah. And there is, and there is a, there is some argument to that, right? There's some argument that if you are not optimized enough to go home, um, then then maybe you shouldn't have surgery. But my my one caveat to that, and and in a, in a little more serious, my one issue with that is that we published a, we published a paper, I think in 2019, on the social risk factors right. for failure of same day discharge. And the concept that you can optimize medical things, I think is quite real, although you can't optimize everything, right? Kidney transplant patients are still going to be kidney transplant patients. Right. And, you know, uh, patients with end stage emphysema are still going to be end stage emphysema patients who probably shouldn't be in a surgery center. But also there are some very young and healthy people who pass muster in many of these medical uh, medical uh, risk factor evaluations who also are, should not be considered appropriate for an ambulatory surgery center because of their social situation. I'll give you the most extreme example. So I told you I was in a, a private practice in Princeton. I had a, a very, very wonderful partner, a huge mentor of mine who had a practice a lot like most of us do, very busy, saw a lot of patients each day. And by, you know, by around 2016, 17, a very busy practice in the surgery center for his knee replacements. And he goes and finds a very nice, well-dressed young man, uh, bone on bone arthritis, totally appropriate, young, healthy, active, great, indicates him for the surgery center. And we get a call two days later from a nurse navigator, be like, oh, we don't really think this patient should go to the surgery center. Why not? Patient's homeless. Right. Well, didn't look homeless, right? I didn't, I didn't ask where he lived, but clearly I also didn't realize. And, and a homeless patient who lives in their car while they can be well-dressed, whatever, it's probably not a safe environment for the recovery from a knee replacement. That patient belongs in a hospital. And one could argue belongs in a rehab center afterwards or something, right? Like, and you know me, I never say the words rehab center. That's like evil in, in my world. But realistically, there are some times where the social factors are more important and need to be considered. And so I, I don't think everybody should be in the center. I think you got to avoid the people you know you need to avoid. The, uh, the untreated OSA patients, right? Not the ones who got the same CPAP setting for 25 years, but the ones who are like, I don't have sleep apnea. I don't know what you're talking about. And then they literally can't breathe for three seconds on their back on the, on the operating table. You got to avoid the patients with uncompensated heart failure. The ones who like live on the borderline of real heart failure and not, um, because when you give them all the fluids you need to get them out of the door safely without passing out, you'll tip them into heart failure, especially 
if you combine that with all the nephrotoxic agents we use to give them a very mild acute kidney injury, which is super common after surgery, combined with fluid overload intolerance, and those, pa those patients end up in forward heart failure. You need to be really, really careful with those patients. So that's another group. Solid organ dysfunction has been shown in every study going back. Stay away from the liver failure, kidney failure, right? Those patients belong in a hospital, modern setting, labs afterwards. You really want to be careful with them. Um, obesity, I don't think matters. Malnutrition matters for surgery in general, not for an ASC or not an ASC. Um, the preoperative anemic patients, because you can't transfuse somebody. So if you have a patient with a starting hemoglobin under 11 or 10, again, one would argue maybe you shouldn't operate on them at all. But if the highest you can optimize them after you've done EPO, fix their this, fix their that, they still only get to 10.5, don't take them to the surgery center. You know, if they drop three grams of hemoglobin, they're going to be at, you know, six and a half, seven. They might need a transfusion. There's just no reason to have that patient at home in case that happens. Um, and then I think it's, it's, the, it's the social stuff. If you have more than three flights of stairs, if you are the primary caregiver of another human being, you take care of a sick parent, child, spouse, significant other, friend, whatever, living alone is not the same as living alone with no support, right? right. If your best friend lives next door, if your mom lives across the street, if your kids are in the, you have a, a, a what we call the, Staten, the standard Staten Island house, the mother, daughter, right? Like if your daughter lives downstairs and you live alone, you don't really live alone. But if you're the only person you know for six states in any direction, probably not, probably shouldn't be home that night after an operation, right? Have somebody take care of you for a little bit. So I think it's more than just the medical stuff. And, and it gets very detailed. You, we, it just makes us have to do a better job of getting to know our patients and some of the details about them that we don't often ask or think about. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, uh, you know, I, I work uh, not far from you, but uh, pretty far in uh, socioeconomic terms uh, in, the, in the South Bronx. And Sometimes we like to say that uh, we have social determinants of health to get to clinic visits, let alone right. let alone to get into you know same day surgery or twenty three hour surgery. But one thing I've noticed that a lot of the pre op assessments, the ORAS from Mike Menaghini, um, and even some of the authorization companies who say no matter what they just say you know twenty three hour stay or so they're not. They're not, um, there's no measure, there's no instrument that is including, that I know of, and I, and I may be wrong about this, that is including social determinants of health. Yeah, I'm not aware of one, although we have started again, like every other surgeon in, in America, we're all getting this pressure like, hey, they're denying everything, book everyone as an outpatient, then we're going to convert them to inpatient or yeah. all of these wacky games people are playing. So we've started to create sort of documentation in our, in, uh, like automatically pulls in from our electronic medical record that says, here's their contraindication, here's their contraindication. And we have started to build in social ones, actually. They live more than two hours from the hospital, that oh. one shows up. If they... Uh, if they documented that they live alone with no support, which is actually a question that we had to change how it was answered. So it used to be one of our social workers who would type it in like as a free text, and we had to make a list because it has right. to be something the medical record can identify as a singular object. Sure, yes a, structured, or no. a structured field. Yeah. Correct. And so we changed these into structured fields. And when we did that, we could pull them into these notes and we started to do it. Now, I can't tell you that I've got a lot of information on how well it's working on our authorization side. But I do think that more and more, I'm hoping when with people like you talking about this, we can get the attention to try to make sure that, that this gets uh, considered um, not only on the sort of surgeon side, but on the payer side as well. Thanks. I am going to uh, take a two minute break and show a uh, advertisement from our sponsor because that's kind of how we get to do these things. Um, and, um, so I, I want everyone to be a little patient with me here. Um, and you're going to unfortunately have to hear my voice for two minutes. Uh, and we're going to thank, um, Heron Therapeutics for, uh, being able to bring everybody together tonight. So just two minutes and four seconds. Hi, I'm Dr. Ira Kirshenbaum, the editor of the Journal of Orthopedic Experience and Innovation. Today's Journal Club program is made possible through advertising sponsorship from Heron Therapeutics, the makers of Zim Relief, and by the involvement of participants like you. The current slide 
show some information about the use of Zin Relief, Bupivacaine, and Meloxicam. Please take a moment to review this information about Zin Relief, which will be followed by a scrolling version of the important safety information for your review. The full prescribing information for Zin Relief is available at www.zinrelief.com forward slash prescribing hyphen information dot pdf. You can connect to Heron Therapeutics through their website at www.zinrelief.com. Well, I'm really glad I still have computer skills. Um, so um, a, a couple of things. Um, there was a question right beforehand um, by Dr. Bayat, uh, who could ask a question of themselves or I could ask for them. Um, Dr. Bayat? Okay, the question was, I wonder if patients who come from more diverse backgrounds are more likely to have a support system. Um, I mean, there, there is some data to suggest that Hispanic patients are more likely to live in multi-generational homes. So I do think that there is there, that, that might be true. And I certainly think that sort of we, uh, we are a bit lacking in some of our understanding of the diversity of the data we're collecting. I think the studies at the moment are all still too small. Not only are they too small, they also potentially lack diversity, although we don't even really know because most of the demographics we collect, we never reach any sort of statistical power for a particular uh, ethnic or racial subgroup. Um, but but I, that may be absolutely true. Um, and then there's also, we just know that some, you know, some uh, cultures, the whole family stays together. They all live in one city, right? I mean, it's for, you know, for most, most of my life, my entire family like lived on one block, right? The Jews never go anywhere. But, uh, but then, but, but then you, you've got lots of other families that I've, I've, you know, patients of mine who say my one child lives in California, my other lives in Florida, I'm going to Colorado to this, this one. And so I, I think families can be very different. Um, whether there are particular trends within certain demographic groups is just something we, that'll remain to be seen. Um, and, and may have traditionally been true and not be true anymore, it, it's unclear. You know, there was a very important uh, study that's uh, actually fortunately coming out in our journal, but was presented at a national meeting by Vin Dasa. Vinod Dasa talked about how there is a paucity of uh, prospective studies that even include race and social determinants of health in their prospective um, fields. So, you know, there's, there's institutional bias in the publishing industry, or at least in the academic world, not to include these, th these fields. And I think that's gonna be changing. I hope so. I, I think there's a lot of people focusing on that right now. And I, and I hope we'll at least, uh, at least start to see it bigger and bigger over time. Great. Um, um, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Marty has a question too, but I'm going to pivot first to something else. The, the uh, $800 billion gorilla in the room, the implant company, okay? Has the relationship, there's a relationship with the hospital that the implant company has, relationship with the ASC. In your experience, having lived well in both worlds, you know, succeeded in both worlds, 
is it a different type of relationship in the ASC versus the um, hospital? I mean, I don't even have to answer that question. If you walked around the booth of the academy, it of, you know, of the exhibit hall of the academy this year, it answered that question for you. Every major implant manufacturer had a huge sign touting their new ambulatory surgery center group, right? I think they very, very well recognize that dealing with a surgery center is completely different than dealing with a hospital for any number of reasons. But the hardest and, and the most challenging one is that your friend, the surgeon, is now your other side of the table business, per, business colleague, right? right? The, the relationships and the things that guided what decisions surgeons made in a hospital-based setting are 100% different than they were in an ambulatory surgery center. And greatest example, I'll give you a very quick story. Another one of my former colleagues, really, really wonderful guy, uh, you know, generalist, a lot of sports, a lot of hand, a lot of, a couple of joints. Um, and his, uh, his rep for one of the companies was the best man at his wedding. I mean, this, yeah. this, is, one of, this is one of these traditional rep surgeon relationships from, from back in the day. And, uh, and they, as close as can be, and when we went to our ambulatory surgery center, we put on RFP with some requirements, you know, whatever. And that particular company, which was the only company he had used for 25 years in practice, 28 years in practice at that time, he'd never used an implant from any other company, uh, could not come back with, to meet the demands of the RFP and yeah. was excluded from our surgery center. And he not only changed his business at the surgery center, he changed it at the hospital too. Wow. Right. And all of a sudden, 28 years of you're my best friend didn't matter when it was dollars out of his pocket. And you know what? His best friend, the rep, totally agreed with him. Totally agreed with him. Said, you should have done it, right? You shouldn't be using our products if our organization can't meet your needs, right? So I think that's why you've seen a lot of the, a lot of the companies pivot and have these new divisions, have these new concentrations on the, on the different business model that exists in the surgery center, which is wildly different than the hospital. What about the idea of, um, you know, the pressure on central sterile processing and trays? And uh, I talk about this all the time, right? No one cares about central sterile when it's, when it's manned, when, when, when it has, uh, you know, people 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a staff of 150, right? At my previous ambulatory surgery center, a Mercer County surgery center, fabulous place. If you've ever seen it, was ranked as like the number one surgery center in New Jersey for a couple of years. I'm um, really one place. Central Sterile's name was Marcus. Right. Was one dude, right? That was it. And he was working with what you could essentially consider an easy bake oven. If you'd like me to date myself to the toys I played with growing up. Um, you know, remember that one? You could bake a, a muffin with a light bulb. Um, right, right. That's, yeah. kind of, that's kind of what- The Susie Homemaker, was. the Susie Homemaker thing. But that's the sterilizer, right? These are sterilizers that were built for hand surgery, sports medicine, right. simple arthroscopy, right? So when you show up with eight trays for a total hip, uh, what are you going to do? They, they, gotta, they, have, they have to come in three weeks in advance. So we had to make a rule. The rule was three trays or less, no matter what. If you could get your implant trays out to three trays or less, you can come to our surgery center. If not, you can't. Because we'd have to be there for a week. Marcus would be there all night the night before sterilizing trays. And how are you going to do two cases, let alone six, eight, nine? So the, a, lot of, a lot of concentration has been put. If you look now, a lot of the implants coming out, a lot of the, a lot of the new systems and all the new doohickeys that the companies are bringing out, they're all come about, oh, it's two trays. Oh, it's one tray. Right. Like, you know, I, I, did, I, did a to, I did a total hit today. Today was an OR day, so I did a bunch of cases. I did a total hit today. And in my hospital, the, one of the visiting reps or whoever, I don't, I don't know exactly what rank this person had in the organization, but somebody who doesn't live here all the time, walked in and said, look, we got it down. You're now doing your total hip in three trays. I said, great. I asked for that eight years ago and you finally got it for me. Yeah, right. Pretty impressive. But, uh, but it, but, and that's, you know, with nothing, not this isn't single use instrumentation. This is right. They're just concentrating or understanding what you need and what you don't need. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's super, super important. And there are patient specific instrumentation. There are lots of technologies you can use. But I think, again, when you lived in that traditional hospital system, you didn't care. It was eight trays, it was nine trays. Uh, and, the, and revisions are a whole different ballgame in a hospital. Yeah. I remember bringing in 93 trays for a revision, right? If I, bring 93, I don't bring 93 trays to the surgery center in the whole year. Sure. 
and you know, right? So you got to think about backup. You got to think about the, the flexibilities of the systems you use. If you're going to do six cases in a day. What backups do you need? You know, uh, actually, at Ortho Summit this year, we had talked about it sort of like we, the, the joke of the talk was, you know, the vascular injury in the ASC. What do you do? But it's more about like, what do you do of anything in an ASC? What implants do you bring in? What backups do you bring in? Do you have a cemented hip? Do you have right. a, a cable set? Do you have a constrained insert on a knee? Do you have like, a long what, stem? Do you have a long stem on a cal, on a extended calcar fracture? Right? right. Like what what do you do? Because because you're gonna break a calcar at some point, right? right? If you do enough cases, you're gonna break a calcar. How are you prepared in your center to deal with that? And how do you prepare for that as you grow? Right. Because when you do like one case, it's not so bad. But if you're trying to scale a program that's gonna be doing multiple arthroplasty cases in a day, multiple times a week. You know, it, it just all starts to, to snowball. And so what I always tell people, you got to think of that stuff again. The work is not on the back end, the work's on the front end. That stuff needs to be worked too. You know, we started planning our ambulatory surgery center program in, in April of 2013 was when we put pen to paper, April, 2013. Our first case was April of 2014. It took us a year to plan out every step. We walked through the center moment by moment. What happened to your And we got to at one point, we're like, you know what? Patient's going to have a spinal how are they going to sit on this stretcher? It's super uncomfortable sitting here for two hours. I'm sitting on it for like five minutes. My butt hurts. Yeah. Like I'm, going to get a, I'm going to get a pressure. What did we do? We went to the local, uh, you know, bed, bath and beyond and bought some egg crates, put some egg crates on our stretchers, but like it only worked because we tried it out. We figured it out. We thought about it. So it takes time to plan these things. You got to kind of plan them from A to Z to make sure they're successful. So, you know, in, in the model, of decreased costs in an ASC, you know, have you seen anyone be able to get increased Part B revenue out of insurance companies for decreasing the cost of bringing it to the ASC? So if it costs $26,000, $33,000 to do it at a hospital and it costs $16,000, how come the surgeon is getting the same amount of money in both places, well, or and, in your experience, have some negotiated ASC Part B prices? There, there have been a few examples of people getting a slight increase in their professional fee at, for decreasing costs. It tends to be a little erratic. They don't seem to be consistent across a payer, even a single payer. You go somewhere else, they have a, a little bit of a different deal. But this is why we own the surgery centers, right? Because you, you, you can do that on the facility fee side especially right. if you consider going into some type of a bundle payment arrangement. You know, you, you said it right, it's about 32,000, let's call it 30, somewhere between 25 and $35,000, the DRG right. across the country for, uh, for an, uh, a lower extremity arthroplasty, right? So if you go to the payer and say, hey, I'm going to do it for 17 and you own the facility, you're going to win, right? You're going to win right. pretty well. Yeah, sure. and, there are, and there are several examples of payers with, with, uh, with um, no risk bundles meaning you only win if you win and you don't lose if you lose. So if your costs come higher than your target price, no big deal. And if you beat your target price, you win. Now, I obviously, like everyone else, get a little concerned. This is a race to the bottom. It's going to be 17000 next year, be 15000 the year after. And eventually it's all going to be 8935 or whatever Medicare has given us right now that nobody's going to do and nobody should do because it's simply too low, right? It's just it, like we should just refuse to do it until they raise it to a reasonable rate. And you're gonna get away with it sometimes. And yes, if you're doing five privately insured cases, is it appropriate to do it? Yeah, of course, it gets fine. Not, not everything is about making money, but it is not fiscally responsible or fiscally possible for a surgery center to survive on Medicare rates. So you can't let it be a total race to the bottom. So one of the, um, one of the things we used to talk about when I worked at Kaiser was that utilization gains need to be changed into operational changes, you know? And so what happens is as hospital, have you noticed this at, at your hospital? I've noticed it at mine. As we decrease our length of stay or as we move people to the outpatient setting, we're closing nursing units. Because if you don't close nursing units and keep the same number of employees in the hospital, all those utilization gains go away. Right, You're, it's not a game. It's fixed cost. It's fixed overhead, right there. Right. They're there for twelve hours, whether the patient is there for twelve hours or not. The nurse is there for twelve hours. Right. So, do you have you noticed the hospital closing units, or maybe you're just too big 
yeah, I don't know. Yeah, for, for for us, we haven't seen it. Although I I think it's I, I think you want to try to avoid that, and I also think that there is some fear of that among institutions and among the staff at institutions, and I think that leads to sort of sabotage. You know what right. I mean? Like, like I don't want to lose my job if these patients all start leaving in twelve hours. I'm going to lose right. So I I think that's the kind of thing that early head on education really helps. And you don't you're not going to fire those nurses or right, but you're going to redeploy them in a, in a better way, right? Yeah. Right. Take, take, take them from the, it on, like the nursing unit on the floor where there's not going to be anybody and put them in the surgery center where they're now short staffed because they're doing so many cases, right? Redeploy the hours, change the way people work. I think if you do it well, you improve the quality of life for all of them. I also think you're going to start seeing sort of shared, uh, shared employment models and shared staffing models across centers and especially across hospitals as the health systems get larger, right? It's no longer, I have a Northwell owns how many hospitals now? Like yeah. when I, when I, when I trained, there was two hospitals, North Shore and LIJ. And that was it, right? That's why my residency, that's, that's where I started. Right. And there were, and the hospitals, you could walk from one to the other. Now they employ more people than the entire state of New York. Yeah. And so it, you know, these places are not going to live in the model where you work at Elmhurst and you work at here and you work at Queens and you, gonna right? move them. Gonna you work in Northwell, right? And in Northwell, we need help here and you need help there. And it's right down the block from you anyway. And I think you'll see that around. You'll see it in the rural centers, the big set, Wake Forest, the Atrium Health, these huge, huge health systems that are now opening specialty hospitals and AmSurge centers. I think you're going to start seeing staffing shift that way, which I think will optimize the experience for the staffs are not sitting around bored. And so they're not nervous that they're going to have a problem. And so that they help drive these quality improvements that are better for patients and better for the healthcare system. So there was a question from uh, Christopher Plaskos. Um, how do you see robotic and navigation technologies evolving to meet the needs of the ASC? Yeah, you know, I think technology handles a lot of things in the ASC. And I think some of some, we need to sort of change the conversation about it a little bit. Um, technology does a couple of things that are really important to the AC. Number one, it streamlines outliers, right? Nobody is telling you that ro using robotics is going to make every single patient better than every patient without robotics, right? But every study shows you're less likely to miss your target when you use navigation, robotics, something like that, right? In the study out of NYU a couple of years ago, the complications they saw 50% of them were preventable with the use of technology, right? So yes, lots of cases go well, no matter what you do, but more cases go the way you expect when you use technology. So since the end game is bundled payments, risk-bearing contracts, population health, the use of technology is going to continue to grow because eliminating outliers really matters. So that's number one. Number two, there are some benefits to technology, especially technology that allows you to either pre-plan your surgery or limit your number of trays or both that are hugely beneficial in a surgery center, even if they cost more money. A per case cost of $600, let's call it, is absolutely worth it if you take two trays off the field. Correct. And now people should, people should be mad at me for saying that, right? Because that's not technically following what, what we publish, right? $180 per tray, $180 per tray. That's only 360 bucks. I just told you, you should spend 600, but 360 bucks were just the cost of that tray, not the cost of how long it takes to sterilize it. The fact that the fact that you can't do another case and the yeah. fact that somebody has to get paid overtime to do it because it's a surgery center, right? $180 is the fixed cost in a hospital where you have 24 seven coverage. Right. So there's real advantages to a technology that can help you do that. And whether it's navigation, whether it's robotics, whether it's single use instrumentation, whatever it is. Now they do need some help because cost is a huge deal in surgery centers, right? While last week I got my HSS email that I get every year, please submit your capital requests. We're reviewing them all in April and May and anything you want that costs more than $100,000 better be on this list by the end of April or we're not gonna look at it, right? Uh, eight, uh, surgery center doesn't have three nickels to, to rub together at the end of the month. They've distributed everything, right? right? And anything they spend, they don't distribute. So it is not so easy to take half a million bucks, a million bucks, wh whatever the number is out of your pocket to do it. So flexible financing, 
arrangements where with, with rebates, there are a lot of things that can be built into the way we finance technology that can be optimized for the AC. And I think, again, if you looked around and looked at the academy that you're walking through and talked to these people, that's what a lot of these surgery center groups within our, uh, our uh, partner or uh, our sort of device partner companies are doing. They're finding better ways to make technology affordable for the surgery center, understanding the surgery center economics are just a very, very different equation. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and it's, um, I, will, uh, I will talk to my CEO about $100,000 being the capital budget. Uh, ours is, I think, $500 we have to get approval on, on capital budget. It's a, it's a little different, but... Uh, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I've, I've invited you to come here many times, but you, tell me <laughs> you, don't like, you don't like my patient population. You think yours is better. They're still, well, we all live on the fifth floor of a five-story walk-up. So, uh, so exactly, so that, that's the difference. So we have a few minutes left. What does two or three years from now look like, Mike? Two or three I years. Mean, in this whole, in this, the, you talked about Northwell, you talked about the implants, you talked about where is this all coming together in a few years? I mean, I think the trend we're watching is only going to accelerate. And it's, the, it's multiple trends. It's the trend of the shift to outpatient across high acuity orthopedics. So joint, spine, we'll see what comes next. Um, it's continued consolidation of healthcare systems, buying more hospitals, but also of them engaging more ambulatory surgery centers, buying surgery centers, partnering with surgeons or surgery management companies, surgery center management companies for surgery centers. I think in three years, what we see now is we, there'll be 10 times as much. I think you're going to continue to watch this very interesting influx of capital into orthopedics, right? Right. The private equity entrance to orthopedics. So if you go back to dermatology, which happened like in the nineties to urology, which happened in the kind of early to mid 2000s, these trends last about 10 to 15 years, right? They buy, they sell once, they kind of sell a second time and they all fizzle out yeah. um, because they just move on to the next growth market, right? At right. that point, you've driven you've driven efficiency as far as you can to make your return and nothing bad about the, the, the money that's in there. That's what the money, that, that's what they're there for. They're there to make money, right? And so when they no longer can make money, they move to something else. And so I think you're going to, the next three to five years, like you're asking, that's only going to get more common. You're going to see uh, it as probably a very good way for some private practice phys- surgeons in this country to stay in private practice, to capitalize certain opportunities, to inc- increase their ancillary revenues, to grow their practice size, to increase market share, to fight off uh, health systems if that's what they're trying to do. So I'm not trying to say that it's good or bad or, or right. otherwise. It's, it's just what it is. You're, gonna, you're just going to keep seeing it. It is what it is. Um, and so I think those trends we're seeing are going to accelerate. And then five to 10 years, you'll start to see that next change, which is from the bundled payment to the population health. Right. right to the understanding of risk, to the concept of, of global musculoskeletal care. Right. Um, because if we don't get there, we're going to run out of money. Like we're just going to go. Right. Broke. We're like, going to be doing condition bundles rather, exactly. rather than CPT bundles. Yeah, I just think fee for service medicine, one way or the other, is not going to be the way we practice long term. It's just not a very good way to to align incentives um, right. to do it right. And so we're going to, at some point, hit the precipice. Now, to be fair, people have been saying this for 20 years and it hasn't happened yet. But, uh, but I do think we're, we're hitting a point um, where, where we're just, it's not going to be sustainable anymore. You're, you're watching employers already pull out of, of insurance run healthcare and just doing it themselves. And they're the first ones to run over and ask for a bundle, right? Especially with the, with the increase in digital health tools, telehealth, the ability to remotely care for patients across the country. This kind of stuff is going to lead more and more to, to that, to that sort of value based, I, I sort of don't like that term. So I don't really know what it means, but right. like that, that, you know, non fee for service based healthcare through consolidated organizations, more use of appropriate side of service, like ambulatory surgery centers, and this continued shift to outpatient, that's only going to get more and more. Well, first of all, I, we, we've kind of run out of time. I want to make a couple of comments. Um, Mike, absolutely brilliant, brilliant comments. Um, thank you to the, uh, uh, audience for some amazing questions. Um, I think we got to almost all of them. Um, this is being recorded. This will be available uh, on Doc Social um, as well. Uh, Dr. Dasa and Dr. Uh, Lok Sharon's site. 
and then a month later available on YouTube. And we're also going to turn it into a podcast with all of our other um, uh, journal clubs. Um, I want to really thank everybody for coming, especially our guest, Michael Ast. Um, Mike, if you want us to just say a couple of comments. No, I, I, I really appreciate the invitation, Ira. It's always fun talking to you. It's always, uh, I'm always so impressed with what you've been able to accomplish here with the journal and, and sort of, you know, I, it's just, it's awesome to see what you've done. Thank you to everybody who, you know, bothered to uh, tune in for a little while tonight. Um, happy to chat with anyone, anytime about this uh, or really anything else, as, as most of you can tell, talking, uh, I tend to talk too much, so I never mind doing it. Uh, barely enough, barely enough. All right. Awesome. Uh, so we're going to say goodbye to everybody. Um, and uh, I'm going to end it now. Thank you, Mike. Thanks so much. Thanks. Uh -huh.